Alright, so this should be the third and last part to the H3MP overview videos. Now I'll go over the customization and mod support relevant stuff and then I'll implement breakable windows as I mentioned before. The first thing I'll show is custom packets. So to explain how this works again, H3MP has a set of packets that is used to communicate specific things to other clients. Each packet has an ID that is used by a receiving client to identify what to do with the data in the packet. All of these packet IDs are defined as enums, as we can see here. Client packets are packets that can be sent by the client and received by the server, whereas server packets can be sent by the server and received by a client. A packet ID is really just an integer that is also the index of the packet handler corresponding to the ID on the receiving side. So each packet ID has a corresponding packet handler. These packet handlers are kept in arrays on both the client and server. Whenever we receive a packet with a certain ID, we can use the ID to fetch the correct handler for the packet in the array. If a mod wants to communicate some custom data, the obvious thing to do would be for the mod to have some custom packet ID with which to identify the packet type across the network and subsequently the correct packet handler for it. To give a packet a specific ID, the ID is passed in the constructor of the packet as we see here. If a mod gives some custom ID here, it wouldn't work as is because H3MP cannot identify this packet type on the receiving side. Essentially, before sending a packet with a custom ID, H3MP must know what to do with it. For this, H3MP has a custom packet registration system. Once a packet is registered, the entire network will know how to handle this type of packet. So let's see how that's done. First, the process is slightly different whether you are a client or a server. The goal is to synchronize the packet IDs across the entire network, so we must let one client decide which packet ID means what, or which packet has which ID. The obvious choice is to let the server decide. For this reason, if you are a client and you want to register a new custom packet, you need to send a request to register this custom packet to the server. You can request this registration just by calling register custom packet type in client send with some unique string identifier for this new packet ID. This string identifier will just be used for the registration of the custom packet. Once this packet actually gets communicated between clients, you'll use the integer. So once this request is sent, the server will handle it with the register custom packet type packet handler. From here, the server will simply call its register custom packet method with the string identifier you sent it. If you are a server and want to register a new custom packet type, you don't have to request it. Instead, you can just call this directly. So whenever a new packet type is registered, we keep track of these in a registered custom packet IDs dictionary in the mod class. This will keep track of all the registered custom packets using the string ID. So the first thing we do when we want to register a new custom packet type will be to check if one already exists for this identifier. If one already exists, in the end we're just going to return this index and we're going to send it to every other client as well. If this identifier does not exist yet, we are going to find the next available index. If there is no available index, we're just going to make the custom packet handler array larger by another 10 elements. The new custom packet types index, or the packet ID, will simply be the next position in the array. We then keep this new packet ID in the registered custom packet IDs dictionary, and then we send out an event telling the current client that a new custom packet has been registered. Again, when we have the index, the packet ID, we're going to send it to all the other clients. We also return this index directly. So if you're the server, you don't need to subscribe to the event. You can just take the return value to know your packet ID right away. Once this new packet ID is sent back to the client, the client will handle this similarly to how we do in the server. So the first thing we do is we're gonna check if it already exists in the dictionary. If it doesn't, then it's a new one that we need to add, so we're going to adjust the size of the custom packet handler's array accordingly. We will add it 
to the registered custom packet IDs dictionary, and then we will raise the event. So before requesting the registration of a new custom packet, you should subscribe to the custom packet handler received event. So what you should do is subscribe to this event, then make the request to register a new custom packet ID. And then once you receive the call from the event, you unsubscribe from it, you will receive the string identifier that you sent for the registration and the new packet ID. Once you've processed this, you can unsubscribe from the event. Then, when you want to send a packet with this new packet ID, you can do it mostly the same way we do in client send or server send. So you'll make a new packet using your custom packet ID. You'll write whatever data you want, and then you'll use one of the sending methods to send the packet. These sending methods you can use the same ones you have in client send and server send. So in client send, you can send either TCP data or UDP data. Obviously, as a client, you will only ever be able to send data to the server. So these are the only two options. This is different on the server side, and you'll see why soon. Something else that must be done when you send a custom packet is that the custom parameter of the sending methods must be set to true. Essentially, this will just convert the ID or the index to a negative one so that H3MP, when it receives a packet with this ID, can identify it as a custom one. Once this packet is received in server client, what we'll do is we're going to check if the packet ID that we received is smaller than zero. Then we'll check if it is a generic custom packet or an unregistered custom packet, which we'll see soon, or if it is one of the registered custom packets. So if there is a handler for the packet in the custom packet handlers array, it's going to call it. This process is exactly the same when the client receives a custom packet. Now for generic custom packets or unregistered custom packets, these are a type of custom packet that can be sent at any time and does not require registration but is extremely inefficient. A generic custom packet refers to any packet sent with the packet ID minus one. H3MP will identify this packet as a generic custom one. In the event that it receives a packet like this, it's going to simply raise an event for receiving a generic custom packet. The first thing that should ever be written to a generic custom packet is a string identifier for it. This will be how a certain mod will identify the type of this packet. So if your mod uses this type of custom packet, all you'd have to do is subscribe to the generic custom packet received event, and then anytime your client receives a generic custom packet, your handler for a generic custom packet will be called. Now this is extremely slow because if multiple mods are subscribed to this event and we receive a generic custom packet, then each mod will have to check whether the generic custom packet has the string identifier that they can process. So not only does this have to go through every single subscriber, but it also has to check for equality on a string every time, which is just not preferable. So in conclusion, you should always use the registered custom packets instead. That is essentially it for the custom packets. With this, you can do everything that H3MP already does. This will let you communicate data from your mods to other clients exactly the same way as 3 mp already does it. Obviously though, there might be some cases in which you'd want to reuse some of H3MP's pre-existing systems. What I'm talking about here is the tracked object system. So a mod can make a type that inherits from tracked object and tracked object data that will be processed and tracked by H3MP. This way you don't have to reprogram all of the systems that already exist for tracking game objects. Now most of the functionality for these have already been explained in the previous two parts as we went through tracked objects specifically, tracked item, tracked encryption, and tracked sausigs. The best way to learn how to write these would be to just study the pre-existing one, copy paste one, and just build up from there. For this I've added a tracked template which has a bunch of comments that define 
who describe everything that must be included in a tracked object or a tracked object data. But if you plan on implementing one of these, I would suggest going through the previous two videos as I also go through everything that a tracked object will need uh, and everything that a tracked object data will need to be a valid tracked type. So now, instead of going through all of these details again, I'm instead going to go straight to the implementation of breakable windows. And through that, you'll be able to see the entire process practically. So first, we're going to identify what we want to track exactly. So when I say windows, breakable windows, I mean the windows, for example, in uh, the grill house scene. So these, say there are two clients in the scene. One client fires at one of the windows, breaking it. This window will not break in the remote client scene because the weapon that fired the projectile that broke the window was not controlled by that client and so the damageable was ignored and not only that but the damage event was also not communicated at all because we're not tracking for it. So just by thinking about this I'm thinking I'm gonna have to implement a tracked object type just to track the actual entity itself of the window. I'm gonna have to add a damage patch for it and probably something like an action patch for it to track the window breaking event. Now the tracked object type will need some script to, to actually track so it will need some mono behavior and I'm not sure which script gets attached to those breakable windows so what I usually do is I go in game with something like Unity Explorer and I'm gonna actually look at the, the hierarchy in the scene to see which scripts are attached to the windows so uh, let's go and do that so now I'm just sitting in grill house and with Unity Explorer I can go and find a window in the hierarchy something that's probably these things so window test wide for example so in here we have destructible window wrapper which I'll probably need to take a look at uh, taking a look at this here there's probably breakable glass we're gonna need to check as well and then I'll probably also be interested in breakable glass damager and this is just there to block the player from moving through it so that should be it so now I'll usually go into something like DN Spy to go and check the actual code that runs in, in these classes. So let's go and take a look at that. So now that we're in the game's code, I just wanted to mention that you should not have to do this if you want to implement tracked objects for your mod. I'm doing this just because I'm going to need to patch certain vanilla processes, but since you would be doing this for your mods, you won't need to patch anything. You should be able to do that directly from your mods. So anyway, let's continue to uh, destructible window wrapper, which was the class at the top of the hierarchy. So this seems to be just the class that controls certain processes of the destructible window. So we can reset the window and we can destroy the different shards that we have. It keeps a reference to the breakable glass damager. So we should probably look at that next. So out of this, we're probably going to make a patch for reset so that we know when a window gets reset, we can reset it on all sides. Now let's take a look at breakable glass. So there are some obvious break methods that we might want to patch, as well as break local. There's a whole break pattern system, but I don't know if I want to go that deep with these. So I'll just check quickly where these are being called and I'll make sense of why is there a break and a break local. I'm thinking one of them is for the little pieces and one of them is for the whole window, but uh, I'll figure it out and I'll figure out where this pattern comes in. So these will probably be broken by the damager so let's actually go and take a look at breakable glass damager so this is the damageable so this is what we're gonna have to patch a damage for so what I would do is in a post fix the damage I would check out how the window was broken and I would send then all the necessary data over to other clients um, I don't think we're gonna need to touch on collision enter we're gonna let this happen on the controller and non-controllers 
so that even a non-controller can break a window as well so we're gonna let it send the damage but we're only gonna process the damage if we are the controller if we're not the controller we're gonna send the damage to be processed by the controller and then we're just gonna receive the damaged uh, data after now this whole glass breaking system is controlled by OM so we're gonna have to see if that gets in the way at all of the tracking process but uh, probably not so we're just gonna patch damage we're gonna prevent a non-controller from processing the damage themselves we're gonna have them send the damage to be processed by the controller the controller will receive this whole damage thing will process it on their own side by making their own call to register glass hit and then I'm guessing at some point shutter glass will be called and from there we're gonna be calling a break method so what I would do then is just patch the break method and send a signal to every other client when that happens with all of this data we'll have to see though uh, how shards work because I think this has some procedurality to it so these shards are kind of generated when the glass breaks I may be wrong but uh so I'll look into that so let's check out what the uh, register glass hit call does it's going to add it to a queue which is going to register a glass hit this if it knows of the damager in the glass dictionary it's going to just apply the damage otherwise it's going to make an instance of this thing and it's going to add it to the dictionary and then enqueue it to the break queue so when we make an instance of this we're going to I guess figure out the pattern depending on which damage type happened and a few other things about the, the physics and then on take when we update this queue we're going to remove it from the glass dictionary and then call the shutter glass on the damager and it's in here that we're going to process the actual destruction of the window what I like to know is where the shards come in so obviously here we add a force to each of them but I'd like to know how they're set so are they set directly in editor or are they actually completely procedurally generated so I'm just gonna take a look at that since it doesn't seem like we're adding any shards at any point to this list I'm thinking they are just set in editor now shutter glass seems to handle the audio and the visual effect of the um, of the glass breaking so we're probably gonna have to pass the data from the hit group that we use here so shutter radius the the force stuff the pattern stuff um, if the shards are set in editor then they should be the same for the same window so if we're talking about the same window on two sides on two clients then they're gonna have the same shards anyway so if we apply the damage the same way theoretically the damage should appear the same on both sides so with this in mind as long as we patch shutter glass we should be able to completely sync the destruction of windows but first let's go see actually at what break does specifically so this is the break method that's going to be called by this glass damager this will figure out some details about the the destruction and then it's going to call break local with those and break local seems like handles the actual breaking of the glass so let's take a look at that so as it seems from looking at this the shards are not actually set in editor in fact they're not even existing at all before the window breaks it is the list of shards that have been generated from the window breaking so this is where they get added the actual breaking of the glass seems to be handled by syn glass which gets the vertices of the windows mesh and then makes its own kind of shape defined by a list of vector twos and then cuts the shape depending on the details that we gave it earlier so like the pattern and the position and rotation of the of the breaking and then each three processes this new shape gets all the shards from it I'm guessing keeps some and gets rid from others or something like that essentially just to have the final broken window shape what I'm thinking though is that we don't need to understand any of this actually which means as long as we give it this data so as long as we make the call to shatter glass with the correct data from the hit group this should be enough to have the destruction on all sides now I'm thinking that syn glass which is used to actually 
cut the glass might have some randomness to it eventually, or maybe not. Uh, if there is some randomness, it might not be ideal. What I'm thinking though is that the shards be different on all sides, and even if they weren't, tracking them would be an additional complex problem. So my idea would be that once a window is shattered, I'd want for the rest of the destruction to be client side. Now this still makes me think maybe the entire window could be client sided instead of making like a tracked object for it. So I'll go back to my code and see if anything can be done to have the broken glass be local instead of being synchronized across the network. So looking back in game, all shards have a breakable glass script alongside a breakable glass damager script. So what we could do is track breakable glass instances and then keep track of breakable glass damager shatter glass and the damage and then in game manager like my other track types I would have a dictionary track the breakable glass by breakable glass so that I can more easily track the instances but I would also have a tracked breakable glass by breakable glass damager so that when destructible window wrapper reset happens I can identify which window gets reset by the glass damager instance. So now that I have a plan on how I want to implement this, let's get back to the code and get started. So back in H3MP's code, what we're going to do is add the files necessary for a new track type. So first we need the actual physical counterparts of what we're tracking and the data. So track breakable glass data. I'll be making both of these public. So track breakable glass should inherit from tracked object and track breakable glass data should inherit from tracked object data. And then what I would usually do is just copy paste everything from an already implemented class. So I'm just going to copy straight from tracked encryption. I'm going to do the same from tracked encryption data. And now I'm just going to adapt this to my custom type. So this here should be a reference to our new track breakable glass. Now we've got to think about what we have to track for this. So like I said, to instantiate this breakable glass, we're going to need to know the shape of the glass. So we're going to need to pass the mesh, or at least the vertices. I'm thinking we can probably infer something like the normals. So we're going to have to have at least one list of vector threes. So we can write that up here. And then in general, we're going to have to keep something like the position and rotation of that glass. So then we'll want to adapt the constructors. The signature remains the same. Position and rotation can stay there. And then for the vertices, what we're going to keep in the packet is going to be the length of the list. So the first thing here that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to create a new list and then we're going to have written the length of it so that we know how many to read. Now I'm thinking that breakable glass will never have more than 256 vertices. So I can store this length as just a byte. So what I'm going to do here is just that. I'm going to have here just an int count. It's going to be cool to packet.readbyte. Actually, I should probably reuse the length here. I'm going to then add a vector 3 that we read from the packet into vertices. The rest of the stuff, we can just remove it. And that is essentially it for now for the constructor. This is all data that we're going to send just once. I don't think we're going to need an update for tracked breakable glass. I will see later when we go through the entire process. So let's continue first 
the first thing we're going to do when we try to track a transform with a breakable glass script on it is we're going to check if the transform is of this type. So for it to correspond to this type here, we're going to have breakable glass. So we're just going to try and get this component. And if it's there, then it is of a tracked breakable glass type. Note that a breakable glass cannot be interacted with. So we won't have an is controlled method. The next thing that we're going to need for the tracking will be make tracked. So here we're going to have to return a tracked breakable glass. We're going to have this script that we're going to add. So I'm just going to rename this. And then add the proper component. Similarly for the data, just change that. Now in our breakable glass class, the data we're going to keep is of breakable glass. I'm just going to rename this real quick. And then head back over, change this to our physical breakable glass. Same thing here. And then in the physical glass, we're going to need to keep the reference to the physical breakable glass, which is going to be an instance of breakable glass. So we're going to have to get that script and then physical physical will be the same thing. The identifier of this track type will be tracked breakable glass data. Whether it's active in the hierarchy is exactly the same. All of this will be exactly the same. Then for the tracked dictionaries, we're going to have to make our own. So let's go where those are implemented. I'm just going to duplicate that keep breakable glass for a key my tracked breakable glass for the value and change this name and now like I mentioned earlier I'm gonna add one to also track the breakable glass instances or the track breakable glass by the breakable glass damager as well. Next, when we reset the game manager to the disconnection, for example, uh, I clear these lists, so I'm just gonna go and do that. Then let's get back to our types. Let's pin these and now we can add our new instance to the tracked dictionaries. We're going to have to add it to the mandatory uh, tracked object by object. Again, it can't be interacted with, so we're not going to add it to the tracked object by interactive dictionary. We're going to have to add it to the breakable glass by damager. So for the key, we're going to need to get the breakable glass damager script from the transform, similarly to how we do it here for the breakable glass. So that's literally what I'm going to do. Just going to get the breakable glass damager script from it. I'm going to assume it's always there. In fact, I should be adding this to is of type here. So I'm going to make sure that for a transform to be seen as a potential tracked breakable glass, it must have both the breakable glass script and the breakable glass diameter script. Next, we're going to set the initial data from the current physical state. So we're going to need to um, fill up the initial vertices list and then set the position and rotation. So here we're going to initialize the list. And then we're going to have to fill up with the vertices. So the vertices are going to be the vertices of the mesh of the glass. So an additional requirement in order for this transform to be a potential tracked breakable glass, it will have to have a mesh filter script. So we're also going to check for that because this is where we're going to get the mesh from. So it's where we're going to get the vertices from. If it doesn't have that, then we don't have a tracked breakable glass because we won't be able to get the vertices from it. And uh, sure, this may change. Eventually, maybe windows in the game are going to have different rules to them. 
maybe the mesh filter isn't going to be at the same level of the hierarchy as this transform, so maybe we're going to have to look elsewhere. Uh, but for now, this seems to be the case for every window in Grill House. So this is how I'm going to check if is of type for now. So to fill up the vertices list, I'm going to get the mesh filter for this. Or actually, I'm going to get the mesh directly, or even maybe the vertices directly. And this will be given as an array of vector 3s. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to get these before I make the list and I'm going to make the list directly from them so I don't have to build it with a loop myself or something. And this should be all the data for a window. I don't think we're going to need more than this. Next, we're going to add it to the local list and then call an initial update. This, again, I don't think we're going to need even an update process for these things. So I'm going to omit this for now. The next part is instantiating this on a remote client. So if we receive this data from a remote client, we need to be able to instantiate it. Again, we don't have a prefab. We're going to need to build it directly from the vertex data that we got. What we could do is processing the vertex data uh, asynchronously so that we would wait here while we process this data and then uh, check for instantiation cancellation and then continue. But for now, I'll just do it in a single shot. So what I'll do is just build the whole thing right here. And so we won't have a chance to uh, cancel the instantiation, but we won't need to. If it is instantiated and we don't want it, then we're just going to destroy it instead. So we can get rid of this whole part. What we're going to do instead is we're just going to instantiate a new game object. And I'm going to give this a name unique to this currently tracked breakable glass. So I'm going to have tracked breakable glass instance and then I'm going to add like the, the tracked ID to it. Next, what we're going to want to do is add all the necessary scripts that the shards or the windows have in the game. So it will require things like a, a mesh filter, a box collider, a mesh renderer, and probably a rigid body as well, unless that gets attached to when it's destroyed, I'm going to have to see. And um, for the mesh renderer, I'm going to need to find a way to get the material for the windows or for the glass. I'm going to have to look in the code again, maybe even in game, just to see if I can get a reference to that easily. Or if I'm going to have to just recreate it myself in editor and add it to H3MP's assets until I can have some kind of reference to it directly through the game. So just now I've actually gone back into the code and actually back in game to see the hierarchy again as well. And I've realized a couple of things. So first, shards are created from a prefab, so I will not be able to get a reference to the material easily. Uh, I might be able to load it when H3MP loads directly from the game's resources. We'll see. Otherwise, honestly, it shouldn't be too much trouble to just make my own in editor and add it to my own assets. Um, but an important point is that when we track a window, the window will have its mesh already built but when we track then a shard as soon as it instantiates it will not have a mesh yet the mesh gets set a bit after the instantiation so because of this i'm gonna have to override the instantiation tracking process and track it myself when the shard gets instantiated but i'm gonna wait until we have all the data to actually track it so for this i'm thinking of just patching break local and breakable glass and Maybe just in a postfix, probably, unless I need to do a transpiler for it. But in postfix, I could just then loop through all the shards and track them individually. This way, when I track them, I know for a fact that I have all the data I'm going to need to track it and pass to the other clients. Something else I realized is that H3 keeps a list of vector 2s to generate a mesh out of directly through a syn glass shape to mesh. So I was thinking I could reuse this, and instead of passing a list of vector 3s, I could save some bytes and pass a list of vector 2s and just generate the mesh the same way they do. 
as it turns out, Synglass also has a mesh to shape method, so I'm gonna see if I can reuse all of that. And if I can, uh, it'll mean that I can save uh, four bytes per vertex. So that's actually gonna be quite useful. So right away, I'll change this all to using vector twos instead of vector threes. And in here, I'm gonna do exactly the same they do when the glass breaks. So what they do is get the mesh from the mesh filter and use get vertices to get a list of vector threes. And from this list, we can then get a syn glass shape in the form of a vector two list. In this, we also have the pass, the glass thickness. This can be taken directly from uh, breakable glass. This means taking the data dot physical breakable glass dot physical breakable glass. And then in here, there is a thickness field that H3 usually uses for this. From this, we're gonna get our list of vector twos so we can save some data when we send it over to other clients. So now back to instantiate, we do not have a shard prefab, but most of the stuff is already being set at runtime in H3. So I think we can just go through mostly the same process. So the first thing that we're gonna need to check for these pieces of glass will be the min sizes deletion timer. So in H3, when you break a piece of glass and it separates to multiple pieces, first there's a minimum size for the piece. So if it's too small, it just doesn't get instantiated at all. And then if it's small enough, it's going to delete after a certain amount of time. And this seems to be dependent on a field called break depth, which is the iteration of destruction. So when you when you have a window in a scene, its break depth is uh, probably zero by default. But uh, once you break the window, the break depth will become one. And then when you break a piece resulting from the breaking of the window, the break depth will become two and so on. So it keeps incrementing down the depth. And the minimum sizes for the pieces of glass is dependent on that. So first thing is that if the piece of glass is smaller than the minimum size it won't get instantiated which means it won't get uh, tracked to begin with the next thing is if the piece is smaller than a certain threshold we're gonna have a deletion timer on it and then there are some other fields in breakable glass that we're gonna need to keep track of so we're probably gonna have to pass these along with the position and rotation and vertices of this breakable glass we're gonna have to add some things just to make sure that it matches across the clients Things like the, the, the minimum sizes, the thickness of the glass, the base shape of the glass, uh, whether the glass is attached to anything, and the break depth. So anyway, with all this, let's start with just adding the proper scripts to this object instance. So first, we're going to start with our tracked component. So here, the physical breakable glass is going to be a tracked breakable glass. We're also gonna keep that as the physical. And then for the next thing, we don't yet have a breakable glass script attached to this object, so we're going to have to add it ourselves. So here, physical breakable glass, physical breakable glass is going to be equal to the object instance where we add the component breakable glass. So we can get rid of this. Then we're going to set the physical physical to it. I'm going to reset uh, waiting instantiation after we do all that. We're going to set the data as well. And now before we add to the, the track dictionaries, I'm going to add the remaining scripts that we're going to need. So to this game object, I'm going to add and actually keep a reference to each of these. So first we're going to add the mesh filter. Then I'm going to add the mesh renderer. Then I'm going to add a rigid body. Then I'm going to add the breakable glass damager.
Now the next thing we want to add to this is a P mat, so the physical material of our glass. Now in H3 this is assigned to the glass in editor, so I don't have access to this. Luckily a P mat is pretty simple and I'm just going to create or recreate the glass one when H3 and P starts. So let's go and do that. I'm gonna do that when I load uh, all the assets. I'm gonna build the glass P mat. I'm, I'm actually going to just be doing the material definition for it. The glass P mat in the game does not use a P material definition, it only uses a mat def. So that's what I'm gonna use. I'm, I'm gonna keep this mat def alongside the rest of my assets. So up here. And now this, we can create a new instance of the scriptable object. And then we're gonna have to initialize all of its values as they are in game for the windows. So first the ballistic type, this is glass thin, then for the sound type, the value is tile, then for the uh, impact effect type, we have generic. Then for the bullet hole, we have none. And finally, for the bullet impact sound, we have a glass windshield. So now that we have this mat def for our glass P mat, uh, we'll be able to assign this to our new uh, tracked uh, breakable glass instance. So let's get back to that. In here we're gonna want to add a new PMAT to our breakable glass instance. And then this PMAT, it's mat def, we're going to set it to our asset of a glass mat def. Finally there is the collider. Uh, in H3 they seemingly use a mesh collider for this and well this was said on multiple occasions that it was extremely bad to use, but I guess we're just going to do it the same way H3 does it. So the next thing that we want to attach to our object is a mesh collider. And the next thing we're going to want to do is get the mesh. So we have our list of vector 2s and using synglass.shape to mesh, we can pass our shape. And then the thickness, which is one of the things I mentioned, we're going to have to pass alongside our position and rotation. So we're going to have to add that as data. For now, I mean, let's just write it in. It's going to stay as an error for a little bit. Next thing we're going to have to pass over to shape to mesh is a vector 2 that's going to be used as the origin for the UVs of our mesh. This is usually based off the point where the glass gets broken from. Uh, but since we don't have that, I'm thinking honestly, since it's just to be used for the for the UVs for as an origin for them. But what I'm gonna do is just take the first vector two we have in the list, and the mesh will just be generated using that origin. And uh, well, we'll see how the result shows up in game once we're done. If it looks weird, then I guess we can figure out a way to get the proper position. But yeah, so for now, I'm just going to pass vertices at zero. And like they do in game, they just pass a mesh object to fill with the resulting mesh data. So let's add the uh, missing data. So we're going to start with adding the data here. We're going to need to pass the deletion timer. Then the deletion timer start and ticking down to deletion 
Now, there is another field called base shape, which is another list of vector 2s, um, but I don't think we're going to need to pass this, as it only seems to be used to see if the piece of glass should be made kinematic or not when it is instantiated, but instead what we can pass is just the boolean is attached. So we're going to pass here first the thickness, then like I mentioned is attached, and then the current break depth. And then there is another field called area, but this is inferred from our vertices, so we don't need to pass it. So now with this data, we're going to need to read it from the packet in the constructor. Oh, and uh, we should make this a boolean and this an integer. Also this a boolean. Then in here, we can read deletion timer. Deletion timer start. Taking down the deletion, the thickness is attached and break depth. Then when we make tracked, we want to get this data from the physical script of uh, breakable glass. So here data dot deletion timer. In this case, we're going to go get this data directly from the physical brickable glass. So this dot deletion timer. Same thing for the start. Ticking down. Then the thickness. is attached and break depth. So with this now we're keeping track of all the data we're going to need. So getting back to the instantiation, now our shape to mesh uh, uses the thickness field so now from this we're getting a mesh and that is what we're going to use uh, in our mesh filter and the uh, mesh collider. So here we're going to do the exact same thing that is already done in H3. So we're going to set the mesh filters shared mesh to our mesh. Then we're going to set the mesh collider. So collider dot enabled is set to true in vanilla. So we're going to do the same. Then we want to make sure that it's convex at least. And then we're going to set the shared mesh same as we did with the mesh filter. Then we need to set the rigid bodies is kinematic. Now note that if we're here instantiating this tracked object like this, it means that we are not in control of it. So is kinematic should be true no matter what, because we don't want physics to affect it if we don't control it. So in this case, we're always going to need to set is kinematic is equal to true. Also in vanilla, they set the velocity of the rigid body, but here again we won't need to because the position and rotation of the rigid body will be set through updates from the controller. Now I might have said earlier that I didn't think that we're going to need an update for this, but we obviously are because we're going to need to update the position and rotation on every update. Then we're also going to set the rigid body's mass. We're going to do the same thing that is done in the instantiation of a new shard. So literally just going to copy paste the function they used. Now this uses the area of the shape that composes this breakable glass. So here we can do the same they do again and just calculate it directly from our list of vertices. So we're actually going to set the field in breakable glass. So here area is going to be equal to the same thing they do again. So glass.area of and then our vertices and then we're going to want to use this here as so we're also going to want to set the breakable glasses fields so we're going to do that here Is attached the 
break that. And then uh, all the deletion timer stuff. Now, in all of these, there are some things that we're still going to need to set. So as I mentioned earlier, the material is going to have to be set in Mesh Renderer. So we're going to have to figure out a way to get the material at runtime. And then in the Damager, we have to set a reference to the breakable glass. Maybe the shards, maybe a destructible window wrapper, and all of the audio events that are relevant to the glass shattering. Like the material, the audio events, I'm going to have to figure out a way to get access to them. For now though, let's start with just setting the references that we're going to need for like breakable glass. Now on the Windows controller side, we're going to know which window each shard belongs to because we're still going to have the window wrapper. but on non-controller sides, we're going to have destroyed the original window because we're not going to track it ourselves, we're going to instantiate one that we receive from someone else, and so we won't even have a wrapper anymore. So consider the case in which a client loads first into grill house and then tracks and takes control of the window's breakable glass. Then another client joins the scene, gets the track breakable glass data sent to them, instantiates them. The second client's instances of breakable glass do not have a wrapper, by that I mean a window wrapper. So if the first client leaves the scene, the second client takes control of the breakable glass, and then if we reset the windows in the scene, nothing would happen because the wrapper never existed, because we never set it in breakable glass damager, and no wrapper's child shard list was ever set either. So we need to somehow track a breakable glass's window wrapper, even if we're not the tracker. To do this, we're going to identify every unique window wrapper with a unique ID, it's going to be an, an integer, which we're going to then send alongside the data for the breakable glass. On the receiving side, when we instantiate the breakable glass, we're going to check if we already instantiated a wrapper for that ID, and if we haven't, we're going to instantiate one now. So let's actually implement this kind of tracking. So the first thing I'm going to do is identify the wrapper of a breakable glass and give it an ID. So to do this, I'm going to add two static dictionaries to the tracked breakable glass data class. I can add them over here. This one is to keep the wrappers relative to their ID. So I'm going to make this into int um, destructible window wrapper. This is going to be wrappers by ID and then I'm going to make another dictionary and this is going to be the other way around so we're going to keep the IDs relative to their wrapper instead. This is going to be wrapper IDs by wrapper. I have the two just for convenience because sometimes I'm going to need to access a wrapper depending on its ID and sometimes I'm going to need to access an ID depending on the wrapper. So now when we make a new tracked breakable glass we're going to keep a reference to the breakable glass damager so here instead of getting the component directly going to keep a reference and then we're going to use that here. And the damager has a reference to the wrapper so that we can use that to keep our own reference. So we're going to want to check if we already have an ID for this wrapper. So we're going to check if we have an entry in the dictionary. not. So if we don't have one yet, we're going to need to add it. So here, wrapper IDs by wrapper, add 
damager dot wrapper and then we need some way to get a unique ID so as a unique ID we can keep an unsigned integer that we keep incrementing every time we get a new wrapper now obviously we need this ID to be unique across the network so a client can't decide on a final ID because it could conflict with one that another client decided on so for this we'll let the server decide to do that, I'm going to keep a local wrapper ID counter, and I'm going to keep a temporary reference to the corresponding wrapper on a separate dictionary. When the server receives the data, it will decide on a final ID and send back the local ID and the global ID. With the local ID, we're going to re-identify the wrapper on our side, and then set it in the global wrapper ID dictionaries. This is essentially the same system as the tracked ID and local tracked ID, but this time specifically for uh, breakable glass windows. Note that these dictionaries are only needed while we have an instance of a window. So we can clear all of these dictionaries when we leave the scene, considering that it would mean that these windows would stop existing no matter what. Now, I know this keeps just getting more and more complicated, but that's just how it goes when I have to implement support for some vanilla process that isn't made in a simple structure. So let's start implementing that system. On each side, we can keep our own public static unsigned integer. I'm literally going to call it wrapper ID counter. And now anytime we need a new ID, we're going to increment this. Depending on whether we are a client or a server, this will be our local wrapper ID or the global wrapper ID. I'm actually going to have to change these here to an unsigned integer. Then we're going to make the same dictionaries for just local. I'm going to see if I need to actually use both. I might not need both, so I'm, I'm going to see uh, as I go along. Uh, so when we send our data, we're going to need to send a wrapper ID. So we're going to have to keep two of these. We're going to have to keep one actual wrapper ID. And then we're going to have a local wrapper ID in case we're the client. Can initialize the counter to zero and now whenever we track a new breakable glass the first thing we're going to do is check if this breakable glass wrapper already exists in the global dictionaries so if wrapper ids by wrapper dot try the value damage dot wrapper out you int current id and that would mean that this wrapper already has an ID, so we're going to just set it in the data to the same one. Otherwise, then we're going to need to have a new wrapper ID. So then depending on whether we are the server or not, in this case, we're going to set the wrapper ID directly because we're the ones who decide, so we can just set it to the wrapper ID counter and then we can add our entries to the global dictionaries directly so wrappers by ID add data dot wrapper ID and the wrapper same thing for the other one so wrapper IDs damager dot wrapper and data dot wrapper ID If we are the client, then instead of setting the wrapper ID, we're going to set the local wrapper ID to our wrapper ID counter. And then we're going to add it to the local dictionaries. And this is going to be the local wrapper ID. There you go. So I'm just thinking about this now. Another problem would be that when you receive the data for a breakable glass on the server side, we're going to need to know if we need to set a wrapper ID for that breakable glass. So we're going to need to know if the breakable glass data that we got already has a wrapper ID or not. Um, currently, there's no way of knowing if either of these IDs are set or not. So what I'm going to do instead is make them into integers and set their default value to minus one so that if I receive them on the server side, and they are negative, then I'm going to know that I'm going to need to assign a wrapper ID to this breakable glass. So let's change all of that. 
doesn't really matter whether it was integer or unsigned integer. Unsigned integer would just give us more range, but I'd be very surprised if you end up with more than 2 billion windows in a single game anyway, so an int should be enough. So now when this data will be sent to the server to be tracked, the server will see that the local wrapper ID is set to a value, but the wrapper ID is still minus one, so it will know that it has to set a wrapper ID for that tracked breakable class. Now thinking of another problem, if we don't have the global yet, this wrapper may have already had a request to be assigned an ID already by another breakable glass. So if we track two breakable glass instances that have the same window, the first one gets tracked, it sends out the data with a local wrapper ID. Then while we're waiting to receive the global wrapper ID for it, we send the second data with a different local wrapper ID. But these two local wrapper IDs, we set them to different values, but they refer to the same wrapper. So instead of setting it to a new value, which actually I forgot to increment this here, we're gonna have to reuse the same ID that we already have stored in local. So in here, what we're going to do is the same thing as this, essentially. We're going to check if the local wrapper IDs by wrapper contains our wrapper. And this will be the current local ID. If it does not have already a local wrapper ID, then we can request a new one. Now what it could do actually to make this a bit more efficient is first check if we are the host outside of that. If we're the host, we can do this right away without checking the local dictionary. Else here, we're going to do that check. Now note that two clients may have sent the same local wrapper ID at the same time for two different windows, but both clients are going to receive both of the breakable glass data. So now we receive two breakable glass data that both have the same local wrapper ID, but two different wrapper IDs. So which one do we know to assign our wrapper to? And that is why we have the init tracker field in tracked object data. So this, with this init tracker here, we'll know which one we tracked, so we know which one we requested a wrapper ID for. So back over here, when we instantiate a new tried breakable glass data with a packet, first we're going to have to read the wrapper ID from the packet, and then the local wrapper ID. Now, if we are the server, if the wrapper ID is not assigned, so it's still equal to minus one, we're going to set a new value to it and increment the counter at the same time. So now a wrapper ID is assigned. And next, if we are not the server, we're going to handle the checking of the local wrapper ID in tracked ID received. So in here, this was all for encryption, so we can remove this. So if there was a call to untracked ID received, we know we were the initial tracker because this was also a waiting local object. And now another problem again. In here, we don't have the new wrapper ID that was assigned by the server. So I'm gonna need to change this untracked ID received system for this specific type of case. This is pretty simple though, so what I'm gonna do is on tracked ID received, we'll now have a parameter for the tracked object data that was sent back from the server. So in here, tracked object data, we're gonna call this just new data. And then everywhere where we call and override this, I'm gonna make sure that we include this data. So in here, that data will be what we receive from the server. So here, just the straight tracked object. And then where we override, we're going to take in a tracked object data. Note that we are going to have to cast this into a tracked breakable glass data, but that should be fine. We're also going to have to make the base call using this. So in each of these,
There you go. So getting back to breakable glass. Now that we're going to have access to the data that we're going to need to set our wrapper ID. The first thing I'm going to do just to double check is check that our wrapper ID is indeed not set yet. That we have a local wrapper ID. And that our local wrapper ID can be found in the wrappers by ID dictionary. So I am going to need to cast this like I mentioned before. So here, tracked breakable glass data as breakable glass is equal to new data as breakable glass data. Now our wrapper ID can be set to as bg dot wrapper ID. And the wrapper reference that we kept can now be put in the global dictionaries. So actually this should be local wrappers by ID. And then over here, wrappers by ID, add wrapper ID and wrapper. And for wrapper IDs by wrapper, we can add wrapper and wrapper ID. So slight problem with this here, we're going to have a different wrapper ID set to different breakable glass data, even if they had the same local wrapper ID. So what we're going to have to do before setting these is if this wrapper is already in the global dictionaries, then instead of setting our wrapper ID to the data that we got back, we're going to want to set it to the wrapper ID that this wrapper has in the global dictionaries. So here, if wrapper IDs by wrapper dot try get value wrapper out int current wrapper ID, then we're going to set our wrapper ID to this current wrapper ID. Otherwise, it means that we are the first tried breakable glass data to get a wrapper ID for this local wrapper ID. So we're going to set it to the data's wrapper ID and we're going to add it to the global dictionaries. So considering how many problems came up during this whole process, I usually go through it again just to make sure everything makes sense. So when we track, if we already have a wrapper ID for our wrapper, we just set it and that's it. Otherwise, if we're the server, actually here there is a problem. So we're going to have to check if our wrapper is already in a global dictionary. If it is, we're going to have to reuse the same wrapper ID. Only if it isn't, then we're going to want to set a wrapper ID depending on the wrapper ID counter and then add it to the dictionaries. So here, if wrapper IDs by wrapper dot try get value for damager dot wrapper out int current wrapper ID, we're going to set our wrapper to the value inside the dictionary and else we're gonna do all of this. So now for the server we're either gonna reuse an ID that was already in the global dictionaries or we're gonna have a new one. If we're the client on the other hand we're gonna do the same thing but using the local dictionaries. So if our wrapper already had an entry in the dictionaries, we're going to simply set our local wrapper ID to the one that's already assigned. And then if we do not yet have an entry, so we're the first breakable glass with that wrapper, we're going to add an entry and get our new local wrapper ID. Then when the server receives this from the client, it's going to read the wrapper ID and local wrapper ID. Then if the wrapper ID is still minus one, it's going to set a new wrapper ID to the data. And then in server, when we add the tracked object, we're going to send this new data back to the clients. And when the client receives this, it's going to make a call to on tracked ID received if this was a tracked object that we tracked. And with this call to tracked ID received, from the new data, we're going to get our wrapper ID. If while we were waiting for our wrapper ID, the wrapper with our local wrapper ID got assigned a wrapper ID, then we're just going to reuse this one. 
Otherwise, we are the first breakable glass with this wrapper to get an ID, so we're going to set it and add it to the global dictionaries. So that seems to make sense. So I guess we can continue with this and just test it eventually, and we're going to see if it breaks. Now, that's not all for the wrappers, unfortunately. This just tracks who has which wrapper on tracking. But now on instantiation, we need to instantiate only one wrapper per wrapper ID. So first thing we're going to have to do here is check if our wrapper ID has a wrapper in the dictionaries. So if wrappers by ID dot try get value for our wrapper ID. And this will be the wrapper that we're going to assign to our damager. And not only that, but I like to keep also the same hierarchy as how it is in the vanilla game. So a wrapper is on a game object and then every breakable glass is parented to that game object. So here, the object instance, we're going to take the transform and its parent going to be set to the current wrapper's transform. If there is no entry yet for our wrapper ID, then we are going to have to instantiate any wrapper. So for this, we're just going to make a wrapper object, name it, this doesn't have to be unique, so just name it window wrapper. And to this wrapper object, we're going to have to add a component destructible window wrapper. We're going to keep a reference to this. And then we're going to have to add it to the global dictionaries. So wrappers by ID add with our wrapper ID the new wrapper and two wrapper IDs by wrapper new wrapper and wrapper ID then we can set our damages wrapper to the new wrapper and parent our object instance to the wrapper object so transform parent wrapper object dot transform. So now we keep the same hierarchy. So when we track a breakable glass, we can assume that the breakable glass is already in the child shards of the wrapper. But if we instantiate a new one, we're going to need to add it ourselves. So looking back at the code, there's actually something I overlooked. So damager actually has a set wrapper method which will set the wrapper for us and will also add the damager's game object to the wrapper's child shards. So we can do that instead here, damager.set wrapper to your current wrapper. Move this and here similarly to new wrapper. Now anytime a window is reset and the children are destroyed, the wrapper will go through each child shard, so each breakable glass that has this wrapper assigned to it, and will destroy the breakable glass. So now we can finally continue. This should be all we need to support the resetting events and things like the damage and the shattering of the glass. If not, we're going to come back to this later anyway. So right after we set our data, we're going to have to add ourselves to the tracked lists or dictionaries. So in the case of the breakable glass, I have two dictionaries to add to. So I have a track breakable glass by breakable glass. In here, we're going to want to add our physical. And then we also had track breakable glass by breakable glass damager. So here we're going to add the damager and then our tracked breakable glass. As always, we're going to have to add it also to the tracked object by object dictionary. And that is the same thing as our track breakable glass by breakable glass. Then this here was specific to encryptions. And this as well. Then our physical state must be set from the data. So in this case, we're really just talking position and rotation. Now we should go through these again so we don't forget anything. 
So the mesh filters mesh was set, that's no problem. The mesh renderer, we still need to set the material. So now I'm going to go back in game to see if I can find a way to get this material at runtime. I'm thinking through the game's resources. And if I can't, I'm just going to have to make my own in editor and then load it along with all the other assets. So after checking everywhere, I was not able to find the glass material in the assets or anywhere that I could load it at runtime. So I've made my own in editor using some random normal map I found online and the same color of the material as it is in game. So I've added my material to my asset bundle. Now we're going to have to go and load it. So in load assets, I'm going to have to keep a reference to class material and it is literally called glass it is immaterial and actually since we're already loading materials I'll just load it alongside the other ones and here you go so now when I instantiate tried breakable glass data I can here set the mesh renderers material to mod class material everything for the rigid body has been set everything for the damager has been set the pmat was also set and then the mesh collider also has the mesh set and its settings that should be it for instantiate so now we just need to end it with a yield break and that's it now if we continue here I'll start with um, write the packet because things like update from packet will be dependent on how we write our object to the packet so we can remove all of this we are going to send position and rotation on every update but on full we're going to be sending everything else so first we're going to be expected to have written the vertices list so the first thing we're going to write is the length of the list as a byte and then each vector 2 inside the list. Then the deletion timer stuff. Then thickness is attached. Break depth. The wrapper ID. And finally, the local wrapper ID. So that's it for write the packet. Next, when we update from a packet, we're going to remove all this again. First, we're going to get the position and rotation. And then we're going to read same as we did for the constructor. So we can just copy paste this. And then we're going to need to set our physical state. In the case of a track breakable glass, we're just going to set the transforms position and rotation directly. So here, physical breakable glass dot transform dot position is going to be equal to our position. And same thing for rotation. That's it for update from packet. Now for update from data, we're going to have to do the correct cast.
we are going to have to keep a previous position and rotation so that it needs update. The server will be able to check if the new position and rotations are different from the old ones. So we're going to go and add these. And then in full, we're going to set the same data we did in the update from packet. So first there's the vertices, then the deletion timer stuff. Then the other data. And then the wrapper IDs. Once that's done, we're going to again update the physical state. And that should be it for updating ourselves given data. Now, updating our own data from our current physical state. That should be enough. Actually, we should remove this check because if we update, it's because we have the physical so we shouldn't need to check this here. Next, we can remove the encryption type to ID. We're gonna have unknown dictionaries added later, so we're gonna need to add to this, but for now we can leave it like that. We're gonna add those in when we implement the events, so the shattering and the reset events. Next, remove from local again. The unknown dictionaries don't exist yet, so we won't do that yet, but we do want to remove it from our own tracked dictionaries, so we're gonna check if the physical exists, then in tracked brickable class by brickable class, remove that, and then the damager one, remove the damager. Uh, so we are going to have to keep a greater scope reference for the damager. So here, instead of keeping a local one, we're just gonna go and put this alongside the rest of the data. And there you go. That should be it for now for the track breakable glass data. Now we need to take a look at track breakable glass. Here we've already set these. The unknown dictionaries do not exist yet. We won't need references, at least not for now. So on awake, I don't think we're gonna need to do anything either, so we don't need to override it. And in the on destroy, we don't have anything additional to destroy, so we're just gonna go straight to getting rid of the references in the track to dictionaries. So in here, we're gonna do the exact same thing that we did in remove from local. So that should just be a single reference, and then the damage will be taken from the data and that should be it for the tracked breakable glass so as it is now breakable glass instances should be tracked but events won't be communicated so if now we shoot a window on one side it's still only going to destroy on that side because we're not communicating the damage so the first thing we're going to do now is implement the damage patch for the breakable glass so let's go over to damage patches. We are going to add a patch after all of these specific to breakable glass. The method that we want to overwrite is actually in the damager. So this we're actually going to change it 
damager and damage patch. This will be the literal name of our patch. So the method is in breakable class damager. It is called damage, it's exactly the same as all the other ones. And then we can have this like that. The original, we're gonna put it through patch verify. It's not a patch that would break the game if it fails, so set to false. And then apply the patch. Next, we need to actually go and implement it. So we can just copy paste from another damage patch so that we can do it exactly the same way. Rename that. Patch is brickable glass damage or damage to keep track of damage taken by a breakable glass. Then we're gonna get our instance. If we wanna skip, keep that there. If we're not connected, skip as well. And then we need to know if we are in control. So this is where we're gonna be using the tracked breakable glass by breakable glass damager dictionary. So here, And if we cannot find it in the dictionary, we're gonna get it directly with a get component. Then we should check if we actually got it. Next, I'm gonna simplify this. So just if trackable class dot data controller is equal to our ID in game manager, then we return true. Otherwise, we're gonna check if we are the server. If we are, we're going to send it with server send. And if not, we're gonna send it with client send. Next, return false can go just here. Can remove all that. And this changes to this. Now we're going to need to implement a new sender method for this. So we can call that breakable class damage. And then we're going to go to client send first. We're going to copy paste from another pre existing damage one. We're just going to go and put that at the end. And we have two of these, one that takes in all of our data and one that takes in just a packet. This one will be used by a client if it received the order to process damage on a tracked object that it does not control anymore. So all it's going to want is bounce the damage order to the current controller. But instead of rewriting all of our data to the packet, we're just gonna resend the same packet. So here, we're gonna make a new client packet type call it the same thing as the method. Go and put that all the way at the end. Then the tracked ID that we're gonna want, we can just call it tracked ID. We can remove link index. Now for the bounce one, we're gonna use the same client packet. And that should be it for client send. Now we'll head over to the server handle and we can go and copy the same damage method here. Put it at the end. Name it breakable class damage again. Here we're gonna read the tracked ID. Read the damage. Then we're gonna go and get our tracked breakable glass from the global objects array.
if we have one, if we're the controller, then if we have the physical, then we can go and skip the breakable glass damage or damage patch. And then we can apply the damage. Now, the damage should be applied to the damager. So this is actually going to have a reference in here. And actually up here, we only want to check if the damager is not null. Then when the server relays the damage, we can just pass it to track ID. Then this is going to be written in server send. Now, same as we did for the client send. Now, same as we did for client send, we're going to want to have one of these relay methods. So I'm going to just copy paste this in here. This we can change it to server packets. And then go and add that. Next, if we're sending this damage to someone, it means that we want to send it to the controller for them to process the damage. So here, we're only going to send it to the controller. So in fact, here, we're either going to need a reference to the tracked breakable glass, or we're going to need to also pass the controller. So what I'm going to do is just take the entire tracked breakable glass data. going to write here the tracked ID and then here we're only going to send this to the controller and here for the relay one we're actually going to pass the controller on its own and pass that over here so now we're going to need the client handle for it so I'm going to copy it from the server handle and something I forgot with the server handle we need to go and add it to the array of packet handlers and then here I'll do the same right away so now since we're on client we're gonna want to read the client global array and check clients ID now down here we want to use the relay one so we're gonna have client send and we're just gonna pass the packet again for it to be resent and we're actually gonna go and do the same in server handle and here we're going to have to pass the controller of the breakable glass so controller and that should be the entire process so from client send to server handle to server send to client handle and that should be it for the damage. When the glass gets damaged, it will eventually be shattered, which will destroy the current breakable glass, but then will instantiate more that will then be tracked. When the new ones get tracked, they are going to be assigned a proper wrapper ID, with which other clients will be able to properly track their own wrapper. With this, the entire glass shattering process should be tracked. So the next thing we want to do is track the window reset. In the case of the resetting event, the entire window is destroyed alongside its children shards and a new one is instantiated. So that new one is going to be tracked and on that a new wrapper will be instantiated. So then an entirely new window structure will replace the old one. Uh, something I did forget though is the client handle should not be taking a client ID. So now I think we should be able to build this and we can try running it, see if it actually syncs. So I'm now in Grill House with the new build. So this is one of the windows in the map. Now if I start hosting, as you can see here, the track breakable glass was added to this. So this breakable glass was tracked. So if we go and check the data, here one of the things I see is the damage is still null, so we should be setting this on make track, but we didn't. As expected, the server shouldn't have a local wrapper ID. It should only have a wrapper ID. And we can see in the global wrapper dictionaries 
we have all of the windows in the scene and each were added to the dictionaries properly so that should be fine uh, I'm gonna fix the damage not being set and then I'll get back in game so in make tracked uh, the thing with the damage not being set was just that we were not setting the data's damager we're still using the local one so here we're just gonna switch that And that should be good, now we should be able to build and get back in game. So now, back in game, if we go look at a window, and if I start hosting, tracked breakable class, if I check the data again, here the damager is now set properly. So the next thing I wanna do is test if this is actually being synchronized properly. So I'm gonna connect a client to this. I'm gonna shoot a window and see how it reacts on the client side. So big surprise, there was an error. Um, I recorded a test with the wrong resolution, so I'll just skip to the fix. So back into the code, there was something that I overlooked from the wrapper's awake method, and that is that the wrapper has a class damager field that the wrapper expects to have a value assigned to. So in make tracked, this shouldn't be a problem, but on the size where we instantiate these, it will be. So in here, when we first instantiate a new object to put a wrapper on, what we're going to do first is set the wrapper object active to false. This way, when we add the new component, it won't awaken just yet. It's going to wait until we set it active again. So here we're going to do what we usually do, but instead of doing this here, we're going to be dependent on the wrapper's awake function to do this for us. So we're going to just do then new wrapper dot class damager, and we're going to set this to our damager. Then we're going to call wrapper object dot set active to true again. This will call the wrappers awake method, which will set the damager's wrapper through the set wrapper method as we usually did here. So that should now be fixed. Um, so we can go ahead and build and try again. So as you can imagine, it failed again. It didn't feel like re-recording this part, so I'll just skip to the fix. So as it turns out, the only thing that I had forgotten was the patch I wanted to add for breakable glass damagers, shutter glass, to prevent tracking the new breakable instances upon instantiation and instead wait until H3 is done initializing them properly. So here what we do is at the start of shutter glass we're going to increment skip all instantiates and then in the post fix we're going to decrement it and then we're going to track all the new breakable glass instances directly from the wrapper's transform. So let me show you how that looks in game. All right, so here goes. And this marks the end of the in-depth overview of H3MP. I really hope this will be helpful at all. Uh, there are probably some things missing to really handle all possible mod cases. So don't hesitate to contact me. I'll gladly help out. Uh, thank you for watching.